So good afternoon um, and a very warm welcome um, on behalf of Aka Hutch um, to our seminar Carlo Scarpa Remodelling the Castle Vecchio Museum. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with Aka Hutch, given it's such a complicated acronym, um, it's the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage. Um, my name is Alan Pett, I'm director here at the Melbourne School of Design. Um, and I would like to begin, begin proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri, and pay respect to their elders and to their families, both past and present. Now, it's a huge pleasure for me to um, welcome Richard Murphy to Melbourne and to the Melbourne School of Design, and a huge honour to introduce Richard. I don't often, in the Melbourne context, get to talk about people that I know quite well. <laughs> Um, and whose careers I've followed quite intimately as a young architect over in Scotland. Today's seminar has a particular focus on Richard's research and publication work, which is focused on the work of Carlo Scarpa. But as a fellow Scottish practitioner, I've had the opportunity to really follow Richard's career path and his buildings and experience them firsthand. And that gives me a lot of um, insight into the impact that Richard's had in the UK and particularly in the Scottish context. Richard founded the practice Richard Murphy Architects Limited in 1991 and has gone on to win 22 RIB awards, more than any other Scottish practice, a huge achievement. The establishment of Richard Murphy Architects in 1991, I feel is significant in the Scottish context. I would suggest that Richard Murphy Architects helped to refocus a generation of young graduates who prior to the emergence of the practice would typically uproot from Scotland after four years of study and leave and go to London to finish their studies, thinking it was the route to jobs and buildings. The early work, work of Richard Murphy brought new hope for a generation of young practices, including my own, and a new architectural vocabulary emerged along with a growing confidence in Scottish architecture. I was in Berlin in 1991. I fled the UK after four years of architectural education because there was no work and spent three years in Berlin. And I remember a friend, close friend, sending me an article from the AJ of one of Richard's very small domestic extensions. And the impact that small project had on a young generation, I think it's hugely significant, not talked about enough. So it's great to be able to acknowledge that. Um, Richard Murphy Architects has gone on to deliver some incredible projects over the 26 year period, from theatres and art centres, housing, healthcare, as well as exquisitely detailed small scale domestic work. The British High Commission building in Colombo in Sri Lanka was shortlisted for the RIBA Lubetkin Prize and I had the great fortune of visiting the building two years ago on university business. And the significance of this for me is that it's one of the few Scottish practices to build outside of Scotland and outside of the UK. So it's hugely significant. The Scarpa's Castle Vecchio is a magnificent example of Scarpa, Scarpa's highly personal language of architecture. It's also an example of his incredible life of detail and mastery of the crafting of materials. In a similar way, and no doubt what drew Richard to Scarpa's work is the level of craft and detail that is evident in each and every building that Richard Murphy Architects deliver. The most recent example, which many of you in the audience will be familiar with, is Richard's own house, which in 2015 he moved into, um, a house he designed for himself in Edinburgh's Newtown World Heritage Site, which went on to win an RIBA National Award, and then the RIBA Channel 4 House of the Year in 2016. And he's kindly offered to give a talk on that down at the Boyd House tonight. Now the focus of today is SCARP and, and, and this work can be traced back to Richard's academic career prior to establishing the practice at Edinburgh University from 1985 to 89 where as a full-time lecturer and designer at the Department of Architecture Richard embarked on research looking at the restoration of the Castle Vecchio Museum in Verona and along with three students from Edinburgh he measured all of SCARP's work at the museum and drew over 80 drawings of the buildings the survey being the first and only complete record of the building in existence. In 1987, Richard mounted an exhibition in Edinburgh, which went on to London, and then it was upscaled for a larger exhibition in Verona in 91, and then in Geneva in 92. In 1987, the Architects Registration Council of the United Kingdom awarded Richard a research grant to continue this work, um, looking at research in Verona, particularly into the archive of Scarpa, or Scarpa's drawings, and interviewing Scarpa's surviving collaborators. In 1998, he was commissioned to write the definitive guide to the building, and in 1990, this was published with 194 pages and over 200 illustrations and 60 line drawings. It describes the history of the building 
as the visitor experiences it, and it follows Scarpa's thinking by grouping his sketches into chronological sequences. Then in 91, the book was published in Italian by Arsenale, um, and this formed the catalogue for the exhibition in Verona. Richard started working two books for Faden Press in 92 as part of their series Architecture in Detail about Scarpa's Venetian projects of the Olivetti Shoreham and the Quirini Stampalia. Both buildings were completely remeasured and the Quirini Stampalia was published in October 1993. Again, it consists of 60 pages of an essay, photographs and a complete set of survey drawings of the buildings. Now, to coincide with this publication, there was an exhibition launched at the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland in October 1993, which has since toured the Royal Institute of British Architects in London and other locations in the United Kingdom, and then it was translated into Japanese and republished. In 1996, Richard completed making a film about Scarpa with the architectural filmmaker Murray Grigger, an incredible character um, who I got to know over in Scotland. It was commissioned by the British TV Channel 4 and the Arts Council of England. Parts of the film were incorporated into the major exhibition on Scarpa at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, Montreal, where Richard also lectured during the exhibition. Now, to bring us up to date, in October 2017, a new and massively expanded, and I can, I can lift this, incredible book, um, expanded edition of the original book was published, Carlo Scarpa and Castle Vecchio, revisited, published by Breakfast Mission Publishing which has been described as a masterpiece by Robert McCarter, brilliant by Kenneth Frampton, and The Essence of Architecture by Hugh Perman. Please join me in welcoming Richard Murphy. Thank you, Alan. That was quite some build-up, and uh, actually it makes my life easier because I was going to explain all that to you. So you've done it all the first time. first thing I must say is that somehow... I was talking in Kuala Lumpur in the last uh, couple of days, and somehow between then and now, I've managed to get a lurgy. So if I sort of die quietly, you can just sort of wheel me off, please. And uh, so uh, I, I, sh I should warn you about that. Anyhow, um, uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Alan. It's lovely to see people you last saw in there. I mean, I was in Melbourne 20 years ago, and I was saying to Alan that people said, oh, what's Melbourne like? And I said, well, it's sort of Glasgow with Greeks and sunshine. And um, which uh, it has that feel of Glasgow about it, the scale of the Victorian buildings, the lanes, the proportions of the streets, the gridiron. I don't know now, but 20 years ago, the Yarrow was rather ignored. It may be better now, but certainly the Clyde is ignored in, in Glasgow. So it has a lot of sort of familiarities to me. So it's wonderful to be back. And I'd like to thank Jamie here on the front row for putting up with me. Um, and uh, it's lovely to be here. So, Scarpa, well, as I say, Alan's th still a little bit of introductory thunder, and, and um, I think I, I, there's no need to go back over it, except to say that how did I discover Scarpa? I mean, it was just by accident in Italy, and what you have to remember, I guess, is that although he died in 1978, there was nothing really published on him in his life, apart from a couple of um, special editions of magazines. There were certainly no books. And in 1982, when I went to Italy, a friend of mine said, have you heard of Scarpa? And I said, yeah, I've heard the name. Oh, I forgot to turn the mute on, haven't I? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Sorry about that. Um, I've heard the name, but, I, I, but you know, beyond that, I can't really tell anything. So he said, well, I've, I've heard this museum of Verona's not bad. We should go and have a look at it. So um, we did, and I, my proverbial socks were knocked off. But also, by good fortune, at the same time, the director of the museum was a wonderful man called Logisco Magnato, who had been appointed in 1956. Directors hang around a long time in Italy. And he had appointed Scarpa in 1957, and he was still there in 1982, and he had put on an exhibition of Scarpa's drawings in the Sala Borjan in the museum. So one had the double experience of experiencing this extraordinary building, uh, the like of which I'd never seen, and then going into the exhibition and then going backwards between the exhibition and the drawings. I thought, I think every architect, when they see Scarpa's drawings, think how peculiar, what weird drawings they are. I mean, they're, they're not finished by any manner of means, and they're sort of strange sketches full of scribbles and details and things. They're quite difficult to understand. So I went back the following year with some students, and this time I talked to Magnato. He didn't speak English, and at that time I didn't speak Italian, so we had this difficult conversation in sort of schoolboy French. But he told me then uh, quite a lot of things, but he told me that there were no definitive drawings of the building because of the way Scarpa worked. So 
at that time, I suppose, as a, as a practicing architect, I was interested in detailing because that's the thing that first hits you about the building. So I thought it would be quite interesting to do this survey, if only to have a sort of source book of Scarpa's details, not quite realizing what I was getting into. So I had to wait before becoming a full-time academic and then, to, as Alan said, took three students off and we did a big survey. And there was a wonderful Italian architect I know called Tommaso. And uh, I was there in the museum the following su summer drawing away these pencil drawings. And he looked through all 80 A1 sheets and AO sheets sometimes. And it's all hand-drawn, of course, in those days. And uh, he said it's on Progetto Titanico. You know, you know, that's a, yeah, sinking, sinking me. But anyhow, it's, um, it's, been a very <coughs> <coughs> it's been a very interesting story to concentrate one's um, ideas on one building in a way and to go back four years later I realized the original books out of print and out of copyright so and the publisher had made a real mess of it and it's all black and white there weren't decent photographs and there's quite a few drawings that have been discovered since so I thought oh we'll have another go so it's now grown arms and legs and it's twice as big as the previous book but I think um, a friend of ours in Scotland came to see it uh, the other day in my house and he spent some time looking through it, and he said, Richard, I think we can be sure that there will never be another book on the Castle Vecchio. That's it. So if you want to find out about it, that's the book to buy. Anyhow, I suppose the big question I wanted to ask before showing you things is, why was Scarpa uh, not really known about in his lifetime except to a few people? And why did it take such a long time for his ideas to spread? And actually, why today there are more books on Scarpa in that period since 1982 than any other architect? Last time I looked, there were 50 books in the bibliography. I mean, you know, more than Foster or Zaha or anyone, really. So that's quite an extraordinary thing for an architect who actually didn't design very many buildings. You can probably almost count them on the fingers of two hands. He spent most of his life doing exhibitions. So it's kind of a conundrum, isn't it, really? And I think during his life, he was not thought of, certainly in Venice and in the Venice School of Architecture, where he used to teach. He wasn't a qualified architect, which was a, a problem for him throughout his life. But he wasn't thought of mainstream because he was a Venetian, he enjoyed craft, and he probably had sort of rich clients. And, you know, in the time of sort of like 1968 and all the student problems, they, he was considered an anachronism, and, or worse, actually. And he was shunned sometimes in the School of Architecture. So he just plowed his own lonely furrow, if you like. And I think the reason now is that people are looking at him. First of all, I think... Well, photographs, I'm sorry to say, are a very poor way of introducing you to his work because you need, to, you need to hear it. You need to hear the water. You need to see the sunlight go across uh, textures of stone. Uh, Arrigo Rudi, his student and collaborator who finished the bank off after Scarpa died, said in the film with Murray Grigger, he said, um, it's impossible to visit a building by Scarpa with your hands in your pockets. You have to touch particularly the wonderful plaster work that he rescued from uh, the v Venetian plaster work, the Stucco Lucido. So it's a, it's a, you have to go there, really. I think that's the problem. So I think it's slowly dawned. I think the other thing is we look at Scarpa now as a confluence of a lot of different areas of inquiry, and uh, Alan touched on these. First of all, I think before him, working with existing buildings was not considered mainstream architectural activity. In fact, Bruno Zivi said, you know, he left us no significant plans, so therefore, was he an architect? You know? and, um, and I think you know, we can think of all the great architects of the 20th century, not one of them, not one project, really, from Corb or Wright or Alto, is a work to an existing building. And it was definitely considered B-movie. And I think after Scarpa, people realized that that was an architectural activity which was just as valid as any other. So we looked to him, I think, in particular, as to how to work creatively with historic buildings, not just in terms of inserting his new layers of architecture, but also an investigation, if you like, into the archaeology of the building to demonstrate the different pre-existent layers of the, of the building to the visitor as well as what he's doing. So that is a main region. And the second reason, of course, he is a brilliant museum designer. Now, after the war in Venice, in, in, in Italy, there was a movement called the Democratic Museum, which was a new philosophical direction, which was obviously to cut away from the pre-war fascist era. And it was very much about restricting the number of objects on display, and in particular choreographing them in such a way that you made real connections between the visitor and the object, so that every object was considered unique, and it was considered a unique pedestal, if you like, or a new background, unique place. The sequence of 
how objects were discovered was very carefully thought through and the space was molded around the object unlike say the previous idea of museums where monumental buildings were built and then someone came along afterwards and did an exhibition in them which is unfortunately what we've got back to today I think which is a bit of a shame so I think we can look at Scarpa as a and it's quite interesting actually William Curtis said he, he touched a timeless core and it's very difficult when you when you look at Scarpa's work you can't date it because he wasn't interested in architectural magazines he was interested in artists and he um, I mean, when I'm there, quite often people ask me, how long has this building been open? And I say, it's 50 years, and they, I can't believe it, because it feels so incredibly contemporary. So, museum design. And then, one of the criticisms, if you like, of uh, mainstream modernism, if we can use such an expression, is the sort of lack of detail and the, maybe some of its um, perceived banality. And, of course, you could never um, criticize Scarpa for that, because an incredible degree of detail, and, uh, but a very modern language, which is not... His, it comes from Venice, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, and, but also from Frank Lloyd Wright and de Stiel and Japan and Hoffman were his main uh, influences. So there's an architectural language there. And then finally, the detailing of the buildings is quite extraordinary. Lou Ka uh, Kahn, who was a great friend and admirer, called it the um, adoration of the joint and how Scarpa brings things together is like uh, jewellery, really. And I suppose the final reason to look at Scarpa is also that um, he left us these peculiar drawings. And having sort of got into the drawings, and that's one of the half, what half the book is about, you can actually, I, th I believe, get inside the, the head, the mind of an architect to an unprecedented degree. You can actually see how he's thinking and, and investigating ideas logically and rationally and progressing the, the ideas. And it's quite extraordinary to go from one drawing to another. And I, I found that just as interesting as looking at the building. So... Um, Likewise, are we okay with the light? Okay. I wanted to start in Venice, and we can't do a talk about Venice, but as you know, Scarpa was born in Venice, and he lived half his life there, and, and Venice is a, a phenomenon. You can't really call it a city. And um, it's the only city in modern-day Italy, of course, which is not Roman, and it's a series of villages which grew towards each other in a very sort of organic way. But I think what's quite interesting is the circumstances of the construction of Venice. I mean, there... As you know, it was built by refugees from the collapsing Roman Empire on sandbanks in the lagoon. And it was, the, funny enough, it was the shallowness of the lagoon that protected them. And there's a picture as you go out towards Torcello of the sort of place that people would set up. And extraordinarily, from that very unlikely beginning, arose the greatest maritime empire the world had ever seen, actually. And um, unlike, say, St. Petersburg or Amsterdam, the buildings are tier two sometimes because they're actually at water level. Um, they sort of appear to float, and there's a sort of weightlessness about them, which I think Scarpa enjoys in his architecture. And the way all buildings, of course, decay from the top down, but of course in Venice they decay much more aggressively from the bottom up. And so as they're built of very basic materials of brick, the solution is constant replastering. And you can see here's a little uh, modest example of how the plasterer has come along, and you can see the decayed bits of plaster down here. But what's interesting about it is the straight line and the, the idea of the thinness of the new surface, because I think um, Scarpa understood architecture in an almost geological way. He thought of things as being series of layers deposited on, each, on top of each other and then eroded like wind and water does with rocks so that you can then see the internal structure of, uh, of the fabric. Venice is also, uh, the, I mean, the, you know, Ruskin obviously is the person we look to to explain Venice, but it has this incredible freestyle, anti-symmetrical, Gothic architecture, and again, I think that was a huge influence in Scarpa. And in his little pavilion in 1961, the Turin exhibition, you can see uh, him reinterpreting Venice as a Venetian pavilion using the materials. Of course, Venice was a city that looked east. Uh, it had a monopoly of trade uh, with the east. And of course, Marco Polo is the most famous citizen. And until the Portuguese found their way around the Cape of Good Hope, and that was, in a way, the beginning of the end. But here are his making trays, um, just about to overflow with water and using the Venetian glass and gold and precious materials, or what have you, in his um, pavilion. And that idea of water almost overflowing is a sort of reminder to us that this was the richest city in Christendom, which sat incredibly, and still does, perilously close to the water and what it can do. And on the right is a much later project, this, the resurfacing of the facade of the Social Sciences Faculty in Venice. And I just want to show you 
One thing about it, apart from the different textures of the Istrian limestone, is this, is that Scarpa, when he's working adjacent or on top of a historic building, draws our attention, cannot resist, in fact, drawing our attention to the history of the building and the features, the historic features of the building by his juxtapositions of his intervention. And I think that's uh, a lesson which maybe some people in planning and conservation circles should maybe understand. Anyway, I thought what we would do as a sort of build-up to Castelvecchio is just have a very quick look at the Crini Stampaglio as the most obvious Venetian interpretation of his work. And then as a, as a sort of prelude <coughs> to look at the one project of his which is, should get much more publicity, which is the Palazzo Abatellis in Palermo in Sicily, which is the odd man out because it's the only one outside the Veneto down there in Sicily. Well, the bridge of the Crini Stampali was put in place overnight as a fait accompli because they were having a problem with the planners, which was quite amusing. Plus ça change. But Rudy explained to me that Scarpa, almost Scarpa's most um, populous phrase that he used was, is this solution expressive enough? Well, I think that's a very interesting idea. It's not about function. It's about going beyond function and expressing things. So as a little tiny example, what does the balustrade of a bridge have to do? Well, it's got two functions, really. It's to stop you falling in the water. That's fairly obvious. So it has to take the weight of someone. Uh, um, uh, but it also has a much more delicate and tactile uh, function of a, a handrail that you just stable yourself as you go over the, over the steps. And so you can see that being expressed in the upright of the bridge here, how it starts off in much more gentle, and, it ca and you can see the joint, as Lucan would say, here as it comes much more delicate. And where the teak is finished with a brass end, typically Scarpa is eroding the brass so that you never get the impression that it's a solid lump of brass, it's a cast, that it's actually a sheet of brass. And you can see some, also some resonances between the very early uh, Gothic bridges and Scarpa's bridge there, and enjoying the arch and the steps and what have you. But the most amazing thing about the Crini Stampalia is its reinterpretation as a sort of boat. The building itself is inserted but doesn't touch the walls of the original palace. So you have these curb stones with, again, a reinterpretation of the palazzo, the terrazzo that you would have on the floor of most Venetian buildings. Uh, but the idea is, and with the, with the stucco lucito panels and a sort of Mondrian-like panel, which come down to the same height as the curb stone, and what happens in the Aqua Alta, the famous floods in Venice, the water actually comes into the building and sort of gurgles around in this um, moat between the two, which is a quite extraordinary experience if you happen to be there at that time. I mean, it really is quite strange, actually. Um, but it's a wonderful reminder that it is a little like a little mini Venice in, uh, on its own. And you used to come in over the bridge and come down and step into this boat before Mario Botta wrecked it and took, took you in another, another way. So there is that boat-like structure, and you step up over, and you know, people have talked about this being the sort of body memory of climbing into a gondola or into a boat or something. I'm not sure about that, but uh, here's another light, little example of the concrete back to the Renaissance arch, and again, you see Scarpa can't resist drawing your attention to the capital, to the detail of the history by his own insertions. The water gate, which of course was the main way of getting into the palace, I mean, I don't know if you know, but most of um, Venice originally was entirely, the, 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 there were hardly any roads, well, there weren't any roads, uh, it was all flooded. So when you go today, a lot of the places you're walking are fairly recent, actually. Um, so everyone would travel by water within the city, and that's the water gate, and he invented these wonderful gates, which probably have some sort of Moroccan or Islamic sort of origins. And then, again, the expressive idea of climbing a staircase, and one step after another, with the water draining down the cracks, and then stepping up and over into the, into the sort of metaphorical boat of the building. And this is one of my favorite moments in that building where between the main entrance and the exhibition room, for that is what it is, is actually a very prosaic thing. It's a couple of radiators, but Scarpa behind there, but Scarpa places this pillar, which I think is a little essay in two things. One is in the architectural assembly of planes of stone, and this and the, here is the, uh, the erosion of planes of stone, and you can see this little motif, which in a way is a formalization of the idea of that you drill into an internal corner before, you, before the saw cuts through it. So it's very, and then the whole thing is lined in gold to point it all out to you. And it's, it's, I think it's an amazing, expressive way of talking about how um, plates of, st of stone can be assembled and how they can be, um, um, what's the word, eroded, I suppose. Now, the other thing I think is very interesting is 
whenever he was doing a surface, whatever, whatever material it is, whether it's floor or wall, uh, if it's out here, it's travertine stone from Rome, because this, in a way, was his external elevation. And, uh, you know, Ruskin said that the buildings of Venice are built of the humble Brenta and then covered in the exotic marbles of the far-flung Venetian Empire. So this is not a local stone. But, uh, and then washed uh, aggregate concrete and then Istrian stone polished. But the thing I wanted to point out to you is the fact that the rhythm of the wall is always irregular, um, of the pieces of stone and the lights and what have you, as indeed is the rhythm of the stones across there, as indeed is the measurements here, um, as indeed as you can see in the middle there. So in other words, you set up, I mean obviously people walk in a regular fashion, but uh, subconsciously out of the corner of the eye, the, all the surfaces are in a way syncopated in their rhythms, and you find that all over Scarpa's work, whatever the material is, timber, concrete, stone. And in a way, I suppose it's his answer to the idea of decoration, that you're elaborating a surface without really actually decorating it. Here's a lovely example of a connection right back to the 6th century, a, a swinging stone door. There's another one in Venice in the Olivetti showroom, but Scarpa said he got the idea from the amazing stone shutters on the south elevation of Torcello Cathedral in the lagoon. And so there's a direct reference there again to Venice. And the staircase is one of my favorite moments because the staircase was damaged, but instead of ripping it out and starting again, he put a new staircase on top of the old staircase. But as you can see, eroding it in such a way, uh, or investigating it in such a way, so that, that the eye can see exactly where the, new, the old staircase was, and it can see what has happened with the new staircase on top. And it finishes uh, 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 not at the wall, obviously, so that you can see the old staircase. And then you see the plaster hanging down is a series of um, abstract um, cuts. So again, as you walk up the stairs, again, out of the corner of your eye, there is an abstract pattern going on. And in the garden, I'm sorry, these photographs were taken in the winter, but this is um, Scarpa's analogy of water. There is actually water here, and you step in underneath the level of the water, and it's basically his idea of stepping stones across the water, and you're invited to walk around with the few objects that change relationship to each other, a bit like in a Japanese garden, I suppose. Uh, and the thing you hear is the sound when you go in there. You hear the sound of this trickle of water, which is then an abstract of the chaos of Venetian canals, and then sets off down this waterway. You can see, again, a notch in the concrete, so you discover that isn't a slab of concrete. I mean, uh, it doesn't go all the way down. It's actually it's just hovering above the water. And then it eventually gets there at the, at the far end. And here is those trays from um, Turin, reused. And this, sorry, this is, should have water in it. And um, uh, it's, again, a representation of Venice floating in its watery lagoon. Now, again, going back to Ruskin and the idea of uh, <coughs> taking a base material and making the whole element much more um, extraordinary, here you have concrete walls <coughs> sorry, uh, where it's placed glass um, squares uh, from Venice and then the whole element of the wall is suddenly made rather extraordinary. And when you go to Venice, you see these very strange things everywhere, these corner posts. And of course, what that's about is not having brickwork at the corner, which can erode, but using limestone. And, and obviously behind here is the brickwork, so the stuccoist just follows the abstract nature of the, what the stonemason has done. So you get these very strange corners, and I'm absolutely sure that's what Scarpa was thinking about in the corners of his walls in the Queen Stampalia. So there's a few connections between Venice. And then the second prelude building is the one that should be known much better in Palermo. It's in a rather dodgy bit of Palermo, if you're ever going, by the way. Um, just look after yourself. Um, and behind this, uh, it was a um, palace, and it was given to a, um, for, uh, um, an order of nuns. And when you go inside, you find this absolutely beautiful um, courtyard. It's actually the only project by Scarpa, and I don't know why, that doesn't have water in it. I don't know why. And um, we would have thought in that sort of climate it would be a good idea. Anyhow, um, it's a very simple plan. I always like telling students this, actually, because you don't have to do, you don't have to be fantastically inventive. And there's only two, no, three doors and a, and a staircase. <laughs> uh, of course, there's a lot more than that, but I mean, that's in terms of physical things. And it's a very simple idea. You arrive here, and you come through here, and this is the chapel, which the nuns built in a street, actually. They privatized a street, which is quite amusing, with an extraordinary painting just here. 
And what you don't know when you're here is above you here is the choir gallery. We'll come back to that. And then you set off in here. We're going to have a look at this room. You set off around here. You go up a staircase, which Scarpa made here. And this bit was bombed in the war, so you rebuilt it. You carry on through there, through here. And then you come through the, another of his doors. And then here you see that painting for a second time in a quite surprising way. And I think the idea of looking at a major work of art in two completely different ways takes us very neatly to where we're going to finish today, which is the placing of the famous equestrian statue of Can Grandi in the Castle Vecchio, which I'm going to make an outrageous claim for now, and you can be thinking about this. It's the greatest architectural setting for a single work of art ever made in the history of humanity. It's quite a claim, <laughs> so you can think about that. Uh, now, this is the uh, building uh, Scarpa founded, and he cleaned it all up, and then placed, again, like a Venetian stuccoist, a very thin layer of white plaster. And you can see the unrepaired stonework of the windows, and you can see a very sharp edge to that plaster, very machine-like, orthogonal. And if you look terribly carefully, it's very difficult to see in photographs, you can see the um, end-of-the-day lines, and there's one here, and there's another one here. So when you stand in the courtyard, and there's some new very radical little ventilation things, but you can see this like enormous Mondrian pattern which goes all the way around the courtyard. So you feel like you're standing in a Mondrian painting. It's quite extraordinary. And then again, he frames the windows uh, so that when you see them in perspective, of course, the windows appear to disappear. His new windows disappear behind the unrepaired stone jams of the windows. But it's all very sharp and machine-like. And again, of course, he can't resist drawing our attention to the actual detail of the history in the way in which he relays the courtyard. Well, on the journey round, he does what all architects have done for thousands of years, which is elaborate doorways, because that's the bit of the building that you come closest to. So again, this is um, stone in a timber frame on a, on a brass. Um, uh, so it's a, a clever way of focusing our attention on tiny things. And then you walk in, you see this amazing painting, which I won't stop. Incidentally, the drawings, this is always good news for students. Um, there was a student who wanted to do some research. He went down to Sicily and he pestered the museum and pestered them and pestered them until they let him go through all their drawers and discovered 100 drawings by Scarpa. So then he wrote a book. So it's still possible to find original things. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Anyhow, um, I mentioned the room in the north west corner. <laughs> This is the uh, Lorana room, and I think it's one of the most beautiful examples of Scarpa's museum philosophy. You enter, and you see this bust of Eleanor of Aragon. And there's only one window, and you see, of course, the light on the silhouette of the bust, the pedestal, and placed against a green stucco lucido. You see, can't resist that moment, can he, of the uh, interaction with the history. And of course, you're drawn towards it and as you're drawn towards it, the green plaster screen continues to accompany you. Uh, you'll notice also it's never symmetrical. Um, and as you go, then you look back at where you've come, and there are two more busts here. One, always at eye level, incidentally. Figurative sculpture is almost always at eye level. Or if it's not, it's because the figure, the figure is looking down or looking up. So um, uh, on a vertical and a horizontal contrasting support, and the blue... Is you find blue flecks in the Virgin here. So it's a marvelous way. He then pushes you back around the room. So it's, I like to think that it's the difference between being an observer and being a participant. That you participate in Scarpa's designs. Uh, he pushes you around. And as you leave that room, Ellen of Aragon follows you down the enfilade. And the next thing you come across is this virgin and child. And again, a special um, pedestal which points out the extraordinary carving on the rear of the statue, and on it goes. There's the staircase, um, and there's the new wit, which um, he built in such a way that it crashes into the history, which I think is quite amusing. And then the one other room I want to show you is the uh, uh, Antonella de Messina um, painter. This is the Virgin as it was originally displayed, and these are some of the drawings that the student discovered. You come in here, and Scarpa places on a 45 degree uh, freestanding screen. There is just not in this drawing here, actually, an altarpiece, which you see in sort of two dimensions. But having turned you here, you then realize there are these saints, which are sitting on panels, which are hinged. You get to here, and then you see behind another saint. So you go behind the Virgin, 
And then you see the, the altarpiece from a different angle altogether and realize that it's quite three-dimensional. So here we go. There is the Virgin, and there are the three saints, which are, which are hinged out from the timber paneling. And then from there, you then go to the final saint uh, there. And this is what you see as you come into the room. You see this almost as a two-dimensional object with a, with a plaster screen behind. And then, of course, as you go there, you realize it's extremely three-dimensional. It's, it's a little game, if you like, but I think it's a game worth playing to, to point things out. And as you go through the door behind you, then you get the shock of your life. Because then you see this amazing, actually there doesn't seem to be much health and safety problems in Sicily, by the way, does it? Um, uh, apparently, Scarpa said, because um, he had problems in Verona with handrails and things, and he said, you know, we Venetians managed not to fall into the canals. Why can't you Veronese not fall off your staircases? But it didn't do any good. Um, but here you see this amazing painting from a, a new angle, which you weren't expecting. It's a total surprise. And you not only see the painting, you see people looking at the painting, and you kind of have that sort of funny feeling of being sort of privileged, uh, that it's now a private conversation. It's your, it's your sneaky view of the painting that she hasn't got, you know. And so it's a much more personal moment. And I'm absolutely convinced that that idea fared eventually into the design of the Can Grandi in Castelvecchio. Well, here we are in Castelvecchio. And I think what's interesting about Castelvecchio is there are four eras of history before Scarpa ever arrived. The most interesting thing is that this wall here predates everything, because that used to be the edge of a city wall that went all the way up there. And there it is in the other direction. There is the city wall, and it went right through there. And what happened was very interesting. There is where most of the museum is now, and this bit here, the Regia. This is the Torre del Mastio. That's obviously the bridge, and there are two courtyards, and you come in here. Okay, I won't labor the history. This is the Roman wall. This is the wall I've just <coughs> been talking about, known as the Comuni Wall, and it dates from when Verona was a free city. But then the Scaligeri captured the city, and they pushed the wall way out. And this interesting map shows you how much agriculture there was, actually, behind the city wall. Castle Vecchio is here. And a lot of the Comuni Wall was knocked down. Uh, there's a diagram of that. But what actually happened was quite interesting, because they were clearly nervous, if not paranoid, rulers, because this is not a place for the citizens to retreat to in <laughs> time of attack. Well, the whole defensive thrust was against the citizens, again, in case they revolted. So this is an outer military court. This is that piece of wall. This is a private bridge. This is where the palace was. This is an inner courtyard, <clears throat> and that's the great Torre del Mastio. So if that fell, you could retreat to here. If that fell, you could retreat to the tower, and if the catastrophe happened, you could escape across the bridge. So pretty paranoid, actually. Um, and interesting, though, because uh, in, 18, in 1797, the French arrived and defeated the um, Venetians. And in fact, that was the end of the Venetian Republic, actually. And, but very quickly, they had to fortify the castle from Austrians. So they finished off the, the courtyard and then built an L-shaped barrack block in 1806, and that is now where most of the museum actually is. So the museum, uh, the, sorry, the castle then was facing this way against the Austrians. And then, so we've already got the Comuni Wall and the Scaligeri, and then the Napoleonic. Now, this is that L-shaped barrack block as left by the Italian army in 1923, when the, after the First World War, the boundary with Austria was pushed way back into the Alps, so Verona was not considered a frontier city anymore. So it was given to the city museums. This is the same facade in 1926 as that. Quite radical. Uh, one of the first examples of architectural salvage, because all the door and window surrounds came from houses that had come down in a flood in the 1890s. And not much is left of the original facade, as you can see. And the uh, 1926 museum uh, toured the building in such a way, I won't bore you with the exact way it went, but the main problem was that you had to go right over the top of this road to the bridge, which by this stage had been given to the citizens away through the castle. So the castle was sort of bifurcated by a road, and it made it a very awkward circulation. And the whole interior of the castle was sort of gothic -ed. It was given a sort of fantastic fantasy, and Italians love dressing up and having... And it was almost as if you, I mean, you went in there. Um, actually, Timothy Clifford would have loved it, actually. Um, but um, 
you know, you went in there almost at the whim of the imaginary aristocrat who was living in the castle. That was the idea, I think. But they had great high parties. And uh, so Scarpa changed the circulation system to come in here. And then, very excitingly, he discovered, with Maganiato, a gate in the old community wall that nobody knew about. And I always like to think, you know, I don't know how many practicing architects there are in the room, but discoveries on site are usually a pain in the neck, aren't they, actually? But on this occasion, it was a wonderful opportunity for him to ch completely change the circulation. Maganiato noticed this doorway and a print that had been closed by building the bridge abutment, uh, the bridge approach. So they excavated and found it. And so they then persuaded the city council to raise the approach road very crudely out of concrete and steel and displayed the original Scaligri approach as well and made this entrance through what is called the Porta del Morbio. I think what's significant about that photograph is the slice of light between the bridge and the um, 13th, 12th century wall because that, in a way, represents the beginning of a strategy that Scarpa was developing for the whole building. He was originally, incidentally, only hired to do an exhibition in the Regio, but he had, you know, he was quite good at making work for himself, and um, he eventually did the whole building. And, uh, but that was the beginning of disentangling the different histories of the building, and so that you could once again see the Comuni Wall, the oldest thing on the site, free of all other um, alterations. Well, the exhibition Alticello a Pisanello took place on the Reggio, and it was quite a radical thing that he did. He had new floors, wonderful ways of displaying objects, a new staircase. Fragments of frescoes were, were uh, framed in orthogonal uh, frames of plaster. Very extraordinary. I mean, this is 1959. I mean, it's incredible to think that now, actually, um, how, how radical that was of how to display paintings. And I must say one of the good things about the new book is I've actually gone into that much more in detail than the previous book. So I'm not trying to give you um, commercials here. Um, it's <laughs> honest. So, but the main thrust of the museum was really on the, on the uh, eastern side of the wall. And this is Scarpa's a drawing of the courtyard. The next thing that happened, which was a discovery, was they discovered a moat which the Scaligia had built and had been filled in. They were digging an iron pit and found it. And so they persuaded the city council to excavate it, and then there was a very interesting problem, because, of course, it went underneath the French building. So if you excavated underneath the French building, you'd have to take the whole thing down or whatever have you. So this became a very interesting sort of nexus of all the moments of history in the building. And, of course, that's eventually where Scarpa placed his statue. Now, what I'd like you to see in this drawing is the idea from the outside, here's where you enter, and the sight lines here, whoops, which control the hedges to the entrance. There are sight lines from the entrance which can see the sculptures. There are sight lines within the galleries that bounce you from one sculpture to another. In other words, the point of the drawing is that Scarpa was thinking of everything at the same time, thinking about the whole arrangement of the courtyard and the actual detail of the exhibition and how it unfolded as a series of, if you like, pictorial moments uh, developing in space. I think that's very fascinating. Well, I mentioned the idea of Venice flooding, you know, water is an unforgiving datum, and if you ever live in Venice, when it does floods, you quickly become aware of one campo is slightly lower than the other, because, you know, water just gets there, doesn't it? So if something's one centimeter lower than another one, you know that that floods first. And I think Scarpa enjoyed all that, so when he made these hedges, he asked for the tops of the hedges to be uh, cut horizontally. And by doing that, when you enter from the moat bridge, you come in at this side of the hedge, and you can't see over the top. By the time you get to the end, it's actually at waist level, and it points out the fact that the, the lawn slightly uh, dips from one side to the other. It's also a nice way of coming and experiencing the courtyard. And similarly, I mean, there's some, <coughs> some marks flooding. The pools near the entrance are filled to the brim, as you would expect. And similarly, the path starts below and finishes above, and he draws our attention to all these tiny little changes of level. Similarly, if you look at the drawings, this drinking fountain floats above the level of the water by about five millimeters, so it appears to be like an enormous stone sort of water lily. And while we talked about water, he was able to turn his ideas to commercial reality because this is in the Gavina showroom in Bologna where he put this little trickle of water at the very back of the shop to um, excite everyone's um, curiosity, and obviously getting them to the back of the showroom. In the Olivetti, this is a classic situation of a... a, a in, in this instance, a black marble tray filled, filled to the brim with a Vianney 
sculpture, again, representative of Venice site art. When we were measuring it, it was hilarious. The number of tourists who didn't realize there was water and stood on it. And, um, but then, finally, I mean, if you ask me back one day, I've got a good lecture on the Brion Cemetery. Uh, Brion Cemetery is probably, I think, with Castle Vecchio, his other extraordinary work of world importance. And um, it's quite interesting, actually, when you go there. We used to, I used to take students there when I was teaching, and I used to not let them talk to each other for the first couple of hours. And um, I don't know if you know about this building. It's a big cemetery built for a rich industrialist who made televisions. And uh, controversial, of course. And, um, and water is used in incredible ways there. And, uh, but the reason I tell you about the students is that you... I think what's amazing about Scarpa, he sort of provokes you to think, but you come to your own conclusions. And we used to sit down for lunch, and we'd all come to different conclusions. And I think it's a, a very interesting contrast, if I can be a little bit, maybe a little unfair. Um, if you go to the Jewish Museum in Berlin, and you go to the, you know, the sort of climax, this is 1930s and 40s, um, Liebskin puts on the wall, um, the architect wants you to think about dispersal here, or the architect wants you to think about this, or the architect wants you to think about this, and you think, okay, I'll think about this. But, I mean, Scarborough doesn't need to do that at all. I mean, he provokes you to think using the architecture, and I think that's the big difference of his work and a lot of contemporaries. Well, underneath the stones in Venice, you find the, um, the, sand, the, sand, the sand banks, and, again, the stone comes out from the... <coughs> goes out from the gallery and just sort of comes to an end, sort of grinds to a halt, if you like, and underneath it is the gravel. So there's a gradation of detail from one side of the courtyard to the other. Now, I mentioned that, that facade, which, of course, is totally false. It was also symmetrical. and It was a real conundrum for Scarpa what to do with it. He, they couldn't afford to knock it down and start again. So he starts attacking it, and you can see with these drawings very strange ideas of moving windows around, very odd. Some windows just disappear. There's a big square window that goes in here. This bay has already been thought of as a place for the Castle Vecchio, uh, uh, the Cangrandi. But this drawing is probably the most interesting, I think, and is closest to the reality. You can see, first of all, two things. One is he took a line for a walk here, like that, like that, and like that. And that means that all the windows, which are symmetrical around this point, suddenly end up in very uncomfortable relationships with each other. And that idea, this is speculation actually, is that was going to be glazing. And so the wall would have been sort of detached from the function of holding up the roof. Very radical, but I think Magadiato, on one of the few occasions, stayed his hand. But the other idea, which definitely did happen, is that the idea of an internal screen. So you, the screen comes out and beckons you in here. It reappears with the Sacello. It blocks the Avena entrance in this um, loggia here. It blocks this, and in this drawing, it becomes the wall to support a very extravagant viewing platform towards the um, statue. And then vertically, there are a series of Mondrian-inspired steel and glass windows which disappear into the shadows and go upstairs to the windows above. So you can see in that photograph maybe the idea of the two juxtaposition. They don't really have nothing to do with each other, and that's the whole point. And you never see the join. So they're just there because the jams are... Um, I'm using Scottish building terms here, aren't I, Alan? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I suddenly realized Alan will translate later. Uh, so the, the jams are angled inwards, so the facade itself appears very uh, thin and insubstantial. So there is the facade today. And that wall, if you like, comes out, springs out of the geology of the prune stone, which I should mention, Verona is blessed by having the most amazing local stone called prune stone. It comes from the village of Prune, and it's semi marbleized limestone. It comes in lots and lots of different colors, and it has the best pavements in the world. I mean, it's just like walking on magic, actually. It's a wonderful place. Anyhow, so the screen, this is a bit dirty. It's been cleaned since then, but it, it comes out of the sort of, you see the man-made, and then you see underneath the thin veneer of the man-made, the reality of the geology underneath. And then it pops out again in the shadows in the form of this incredible box, the Sacello, which is a cube, which is decorated in cubes of prune stone of different colors, within which are prune... Uh, are squares of, of smooth prune stone. And you can see Scarpa investigating how it should all sit on the ground. And that's really all about um, setting up an air of mystery, I think, but also setting off the sarcophagus, which he sits uh, immediately adjacent and uh, enjoying the, the, the material that it's also made out of prune stone. I'm not going to talk in detail about all these drawings, but um, it's... Uh, yeah, you probably get the idea. They're absolutely scattered in sketches and things, which once you start looking at them, it becomes absolutely fascinating. 
There's the central loggia, which of course is fascinating to see in parallax. Scarpa's placing of these three saints in their niches within the uh, three, oh my god, that photograph's the wrong way around, I just realized, I'm sorry about that. Um, never mind, but it's uh, within the three arches of the loggia, and you see how the, uh, the new terrace submerges the um, base of the column like a sort of layer of volcanic ash or something, and you just see how it's like a new layer horizontally there as well. So there is the effect of the new screen on that central bay. And then finally, this window here. Again, Scarpa can't resist the expressive idea that the screen has to do something to set up a sort of tension with the old. And it's interesting, actually, if you look at the windows on the east elevation, where there's nothing to, to go vertical to, Scarpa makes them much more horizontal in, in proportion. Uh, but again, the same device of disappearing into the shadows behind the original is employed. And then finally, when you get to the Can Grande space, there's this incredibly extraordinary cut, and you can see the construction, you can see bits of bricks left out, but most importantly, I think, is the conceit that what he thinks of as solid matter, the poche, if you like, is not really like that. It's actually made out of, as, if you can imagine, a series of preformed laminates. It's made out of a sort of sedimentary rock, if you like, or sediments that all get cut and come to a sort of grinding halt in a different place. And I think it's, you can see in his sketches, whenever he cuts into the wall of the castle, it quite often is sort of ziggurated in such a way to give you that impression. Of course, it's completely nonsense. It's not like that at all. It's just a solid stone wall, but it's an idea that it's made out of planes. And even a little tiny window, you with one single mullion set off uh, the center, sets up a sort of tension, a sort of frisson with the existing. And of course, all those ideas of an eroded masonry facade, which then has connections behind of a new screen we can see in his building at the, for the Bank Popular, also in Verona, which he uh, didn't finish before he died. It was finished by Rudy, and um, a fascinating new building. Well, um, his initial idea for placing the statue was actually at the entrance, and he wanted to make this entrance an enormous space. And you see the battlements he sketched on the drawings here, because he was very conscious that this was a French building that had blocked the view of the river and made the, made the uh, courtyard smaller. And I think he wanted to sort of tell people that. You can see his little balcony here from which to see the uh, Can Grande a second time. And there's a whole series of developments of this idea, and he kind of suddenly throws it away. And I think it's because there's no historical resonance, because this was all built at the same time. So and there's some more drawings of that on the left. But in fact, the entrance room becomes much more modest. It becomes a cube of space carved out of the room with the exit uh, staircase uh, operating between the two. Now, when you walk in, there are planes going back. And I think the, you think in a way about the whole composition. Right from the courtyard is a series of parallel planes which march in from the courtyard right into the building itself. And in this instance, there's a plane of concrete which is itself um, uh, eroded with bush hammered concrete here, and then the wall behind, and then the idea in a way that the thickness of the wall is itself something independent of the wall itself. And you can see these very strange uh, idea of a sort of almost very vulnerable bits of plaster or something uh, between you and this niche from which you're invited to go and see you. You're here first, and then you see the river. And uh, that idea of layering the back of the room, I think, comes across in most of these sketches. And he goes through various ideas. And this is a photograph of how it was. I'm sorry to say it's now a bit screwed up with the shop. But the other interesting thing is you can see that this steelwork has a tiny cut in it. So that's not structural. It just is an edge. And uh, so you're invited to see the thinness of it all, which I think is... Scarpa's idea, he likes you to see, to read the three-dimensionality of what he's doing. Well, the main sculpture hall has been through um, various uh, manifestations. This is it in a Vena's museum, um, pretty fantastic Gothic fantasy. This was really where horses were stabled by the French, so there's quite an inventive interior designer at work there. And this is Scarpa's provisional um, uh, uh, arrangement, which sat there from 1959 to 1962. Then with more money, they completely changed the downstairs, and the, it becomes an exercise in an extraordinarily beautiful and orthogonal floor, where, not, again, none of the um, dimensions repeat in any direction. The floor, Scarpa told us, was analogous to water. Again, the concrete is analogous to water spreading over its rim, a little cascade here. But the idea is, again, to have a contrast between that and the deliberate roughness of the original room. In fact, 
here's his pragmatism. This used to sit as a threshold stone, prune stone, and he had it raised up one day, and he so liked the underside of the roughness that he raised them all up and had ones to match on the other side as well to contribute to the ruffling up of the interior against this incredible sort of, it becomes a series of coordinates, if you like, where the, the sculptures are incredibly carefully placed. There's our uh, pencil drawing of uh, whatever it was, 1622 or something, I can't remember what it is. Um, but what I wanted to show you about that is you can see it's all orthogonal, but the interesting thing is that the river wall isn't. So that when you get typically here, for example, and also here, you can see a tiny trapezoid of space. And that, again, points out to people who would never otherwise notice uh, the nature of the river wall. And there, in fact, is that moment. And there's the sort of idea of the cascade at the entrance. Well, so I won't bore you with this, but the, all the windows are different. All the dimensions are different. You can see him indicating the sections of the windows there and the plan of the whole thing, which is all mixed up with a section and um, all very difficult to understand. He drew on anything that came to hand, photographs, and enjoyed, look at the fantastic contrast between the sort of sharpness of the steel, the timber opening windows, and then behind the Gothic windows and uh, amazing patterns they set up. Now, there is a wonderful story about the beam in the, in the uh, sculpture gallery because Scarpa, they took the ceiling down and wanted to remake it because it was unsafe. And he wanted to make a cross beam here. But his engineer, Maschietto, calculated it needed to be 600 mil. And... Uh, that didn't work because it crashed into the windows. So, as typically an engineer might say, um, he said, put a column in the middle of every room, which is the sort of useless things that, America, that engineers do say. And, but from that, uh, Scarpa realized that if he took point support there and transferred it to a, a steel beam, he could have his very shallow cross of concrete um, beams. And so this is what happens. There is a rolling cylinder which takes up the differential movement between the two materials. And this is an absolutely amazing example of an in-situ made steel beam. It's a double steel beam. You can see it in section there. A series of flats which are joined by flats here riveted. And you can see that characteristic notch to show you the nature of the steel. And then back to back with hexagonal bolts here. And then the rivets go along the bottom and top of L shape. And then at this point, they get, it gets shallower, as structurally it should do. But what's interesting here is the wall dips to meet the beam, and the beam dips to meet the wall, like that. So you can see how the beam acknowledges the wall, the wall acknowledges the beam, but you never actually see where the two um, join. And in fact, what that sets up is an illusion that the beam is going through the wall and popping out on the other side. So from an engineering um, imperative came a brilliant architectural idea that the cross beams describe the cubic nature of each of the rooms, but the steel beam threads them all together like a, I suppose, like a string of pearls or something. That's our more recent drawing, and I wanted to just talk about the interior there, there, and here. I think that's it. Um, the interior of the Sacello, I think, is fascinating because it's a classic example of how museum design and the architectural design are totally fused because it's like a game of Russian dolls. The objects appear from the steelwork. The steelwork is inserted into the box but doesn't touch the box. The box, as we've seen from the outside, is inserted into the window and therefore is inserted into the main gallery. So everything, in a way, uh, connects to everything else. And there's a series of objects, pedestals. This didn't happen. Uh, dis display case and what have you. And Scarpa was very conscious of it was for objects for a tomb. So it is a bit tomb-like with this. He's very conscious of this ray of sunlight that moved around uh, during the course of the day. So it's a really incredibly beautiful place to look at these small objects. Now, in the main, the second room of, I mean, I have to say again, sorry, it sounds like a commercial plug, but I actually massively expanded this bit. So this whole gallery now is seriously kind of um, explained. Uh, so we'll just quickly look at one room. When you walk in, you see the rear of uh, St. Cecilia. In fact, there's an RT, RAI film of Scarpa talking about it where he says you see the tassel and the carving and you're intrigued and you, you go around and look at, at the front. And having seen the front and you enjoy the front, you go around again and then you see St. Catherine of Alexandra who's sitting beautifully with side light illustrating her, her robes. And then when you look at St. Catherine, she looks at St. Martyr and um, St. Bartholomew sitting on their plinth. And you realize at this point, actually... Everybody is looking in this direction. They're looking at St. Bartholomew, actually. If you go and stand next to St. Bartholomew when you're there, 
it's quite, it's quite eerie, actually, because everybody's looking at you. All the, all the sculptors are looking at you. These two guys, this is St. John, who is looking down, so he's placed above, so he looks down at your eye level as you go down the building. This is San Zeno, who looks, what's left of him, looks down here. But also, interestingly, he's sitting in a vault, so it's interesting to see him from below. You can see him in the vault. And on this side is a Madonna and child, which you look down at as you pass uh, through the threshold. So, and they're all looking at St. Bartholomew. And then you go into the next room, and this wonderful Madonna greets you, uh, and she's given a white screen. She's quite small, so it sets up a, a, a small-scale display. And then, typically, this is Stucco Luchagos. The steelwork starts from the steel frame and then negotiates here. And then one of Scarpa's most um, prevalent gestures is the idea of the hand offering something out to the visitor. So what the steel doesn't do is crash into the, the, the plasterwork. That would, that would sort of word downgrade the plasterwork, but it actually comes from the steel. And then at the other end of the object is this wonderful Pompeii red, where a totally different Madonna, much more static than this one, is put uh, three-sided at this end. And this one is framed in steel, so you see the sort of roughness of the stone against the sharpness of the steel. And these two fragments made out of marble with incredible red grains is, I think, where the red comes from, because they look absolutely amazing up against that uh, plasterwork. So it's things you notice when you're studying it. And there, there she is. And there's the classic detail of Scarpa's journey, if you like, cutting in and framing it with a brass uh, ring, um, which basically describes what the blacksmith does to make an internal corner. And the next room is probably the most spectacular of all of the displays, uh, crucifixion with two saints on the abstract of a crucifixion. Note the little notch there to tell you how thick this is. The original, his scholar had ideas for saints in the shadows. He's very interested in how light falls on the plaster and how light falls on the stucco lucido. There's a whole series of drawings of this. That's our drawing of it. And that's the rear state. Uh, often you'll find him making a composition of two paths actually sort of joined, if you like. And from that join comes the structure which then negotiates itself. So it's a very, I have to use the word expressive all the time. It's a very expressive way of keeping the whole thing up. Well, if you take a journey across the bridge to the river, you'll see uh, another interesting thing. This, of course, is the French wall. That's the Scaligri. So 500 years separate this and this and this and this. So Scarpa was perplexed as to how to deal with this corner of the castle, which was going to be a library at the lower level and a gallery at the upper level, because they don't participate in the elevation on the courtyard. They don't have any windows. So eventually, after a lot of investigation, he makes this extraordinary cut. Magnata called it a suture, which I think is quite interesting. An incredible cut, which lets light in, but also historically um, distinguishes the two pieces of history. And the same thing happens here, but smaller. And that is the, well, one of the investigative plans of that cut. You see how the wall, in this instance, was going to be delaminated, if you like. That's him drawing on a photograph. And that's what it is now. Now, the interesting thing about <coughs> what's happening here is three architectural ideas are colliding or coming together um, to authorize this act of work. First of all, it's a programmatic one of getting light in. So that's fairly obvious. You need light in a library. You need light in a gallery. Secondly, as I mentioned, it's a historical idea of cleaving the two bits of history apart from each other. But I think very interesting is the formal idea that this tower had been totally compromised by the wall crashing into it so that this corner, the internal corner of the tower, all the other corners are on the outside, was completely lost. So Scarpa's window does a sort of negotiation around the corner and joins it from the south side. And similarly, well, there you can see the idea. In fact, there is the corner of the tower on the outside. And upstairs, he does the same thing, brings the tower into, this, uh, into the Sala Avena, but there's a little tiny bit of glass here that you can see it carrying on down to underneath. Now, finally, the placing of the Can Grande. I mean, we're, we're looking at about a quarter of the museum. I'm sorry to say we'd be here all afternoon if I look at the whole thing. And um, here we, as I mentioned, the problem of the moat. And the moat kind of carried on underneath the building. And what Scarpa did was incredible. It was a sort of extraordinary <coughs> creative compromise. <laughs> and you can see the moat disappearing under the French building. And so the moat is semi excavated and the, the wall is semi-demolished and you can see where it originally was there. So in your mind's eye you can see what's going on but the idea is introduced to you by a window in the floor in the last gallery here. So you look down and you see the moat and you think hello what's going on here? 
This is quite interesting as an exhibit. It's actually a very incredibly beautifully detailed, if ever, I mean, Lou Kahn was absolutely right, wasn't he? The adoration of the joint, it really is quite extraordinary. This is actually one of Scarpa's full-size drawings there. And I love this drawing because uh, this is the Napoleonic Grand Staircase to get his soldiers up to the battlements, which they knocked down. And uh, funny enough, they did that in 1963, and kind of ironically, Icomos was founded in 1964. And you know Icomos, the, the uh, Council for Preservation of Historic, whatever it is. And uh, they've had various pronouncements ever since, and I'm pretty sure that had it been later, Scarpa would never have got away with demolishing that staircase, but he did, anyhow. But the other thing you can think about this is that this is him sketching on his vague ideas. He had the confidence in both himself and Maganiato. They knew what they were doing, this had to go, but he didn't actually have a clear idea of what he was going to do, which when you think about that today is quite absolutely extraordinary. Now, what's amazing about this space that's created, it's, it's created as much by demolition as by creation, if you like, that it brings into the space elements of the castle as backgrounds to the statue. Most obviously is the gigantic presence of the Torre del Mastio, which is now brought in through this um, cut. You can see, again, the roof just expressively, all, all structure is always bifurcated, by the way. The, the, the structure comes and points just onto the walls, a very expressive gesture, so keeping up the roof. And you can see, of course, it's cut back in an orthogonal way, so again, we appreciate the gradual curve of the Comuni wall against the orthogonal. And if you look at the underside of this very oversized bird's nest structure, it's, it's made of a series of truss rafters and purlins, and one beam. Now, when you make an orthogonal architecture, if you put one thing at an angle, it becomes incredibly significant. There's that one beam holding up the ridge beams. And then you look and you see these are regularly spaced, but these have been pushed back and bunched back. So it's an idea, I think, an expressive idea, that not only has the, the, the roof been cut, but it's been actively pushed back more on one side than the other to let the light into the statue who sits, of course, asymmetrically underneath. And uh, there you can see again uh, the horseman, oops, and the castle. And the new, the new roof is sliding under, again, into the shadows of the Roman tile roof. There was an idea for glass as a third element, which never actually happened. And there you can see it from the top of the tower, just putting its hand on the, on the battlements. And at the bottom side, the floor doesn't quite touch the walls anywhere, so you have this sense of the underworld going on. And then at, at first floor, you are channeled through a very narrow new opening in the Comuni wall, down a staircase, and then you suddenly realize you see this amazing staircase opposite, which is another fantastic example of Scarpa playing with the idea of stepping up a stair. And this is a beautiful moment placed asymmetrically. It's typically a step held out to invite you to walk along the battlements. And actually at that point, you can hear and see the water on the bridge moment. As you go down that staircase, incidentally, I, I won't show you today, but an incredible series of framed views, both of Verona and of the castle, which is, I think, absolutely not coincidental. Well, I mentioned Scarpa's ladder stairs, which they're called. They're quite fun. This is a naughty one, in case you hadn't spotted, because it goes left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. Uh, this is one in the Brion uh, Cemetery. Here's one in the Crini Stampalia. And there's the view down towards that uh, uh, staircase, which crashes through the common room, all these huge lintels up above. And similarly, staircases, the exit staircase, where Scarpa places, just like in the Crini Stampalia, the screens hang down, but there's a five millimeter gap between the screen and the stair itself. Now, demolishing the entire space obviously is dramatic and made even more dramatic by placing a bridge across it at 45 degrees. It's an incredibly beautiful bridge made out of steel and timber bal balustrades. Again, no piece of timber is the same width as its adjacent one. And that um, resonates with the timber screen here. To the, this is the only elevation he designed here. Which, is, which when we discover, it's a background to the horse, but then we also discover it is itself a display for these five paintings by Cavazzola. So I think that's another very fascinating example of Scarpa simultaneously thinking about the display of the paintings and the architecture of the building. And then the tympanum of the, of the gable end, if you like, is a series of sort of heraldic banners uh, behind the count. And there you can see how that doesn't quite reach the ceiling, so it's a freestanding object. And from here, you can also see the Can Grande all the way down the galleries that way. Well, there he sits. A replica of him sits now in the Piazza Signore. 
And here he sat very sadly parked in the Regia Courtyard by Avena, who obviously didn't recognize his importance. And then Scarpa had various ideas for him. He wasn't going to completely demolish this bay at all. And you can follow the progress. You can literally see him pulling the uh, statue up to the light. And there's the statue there. And you can see him thinking about all the different many places that you can see the statue. And I think one of the interesting things about it is there is no one place to see. And that's why it's such a modern idea. There is no one particular place from which you see the statue. You're always invited to move and see it in a different way. And the pedestal that it sits on started off as the old spire. And, and you can see it was getting lifted up to get to the eye level of people on the bridge. And then that was thrown away and a double column idea with the horseman uh, looking out was employed uh, with a very big viewing platform. And then Maganiato said that Scarpa almost in an afternoon decided the solution had become too elaborate. And he developed this concrete uh, pedestal which again offers the statue out as a, on a hand and turns the statue inwards to the space as you can see here, and you can see him sketching the skylines. Now, the interesting thing about it is, is it's made, again, Magallanes described it as origami, concrete origami, because it's made out of planes with deliberate slots cut in various places so that from whatever angle you look at it, you realize it's a planar composition rather than something out of solid concrete. So there it sits, as a, as, almost as a two-dimensional object against the shadows, framed by the Porta del Morbio here, uh, incredible uh, light uh, playing on the space during the course of the day. This is a steel viewing platform that Scarpa uh, made, which I'll come back to in a second. As you come out of the space, you see it in spiky silhouette, just as you would have done in the Piazza Signori many years ago. The shadow of the statue moves around on a sunny day. And I think this drawing in particular, that's not a drawing, but this drawing is a particularly beautiful example of Scarpa's idea of museum as a, as a single one-to-one -one conversation between the visitor and the statue on the viewing platform. And I think, the, as you move, the background moves constantly. So here is the statue against the Comuni wall, there against the moat, there against the roof, and the Torre del Mastio. And then I think, I mean, Ruskin certainly sketched the horse and the, um, the knight separately, which I thought was quite interesting, because I think he kind of came to the conclusion it was two sculptures in one. And maybe Scarpa did too, because he invites you to move around it, and you observe how the knight and the horse sort of change their relationship as they go around and go down and then have this wonderful moment on the viewing platform up against the tower. And then inside you can see um, the statue. And then now they have opened up the battlement walk, which wasn't part of Scarpa's design, but I'm sure he would appreciate it that you can see it from above as well. And of course it creates a fantastic theater. I mean, when we were working in the space, measuring it and what have you, uh, nobody could just walk through, no matter who it was. Everyone stops, gesticulates, talks, investigates it. And uh, so I think Scarpa created um, incredible connection, if you like, between people and the statue. So there it is. And final slide is there you now see it from the battlements. You can see the moat. Uh, you can see the hills behind Verona. You can see everything there. And I think what's brilliant is, again, it pulls three things together. Museologically, it sits at the fulcrum between the two sides of the museum, which I think is brilliant in itself. Secondly, it exploits that tight knot where all the histories come together. The Comuni wall, now free of everything uh, that was up against it, the Scaligeri uh, bridge and the tower and the moat, the Napoleonic wall, and even Avena's uh, facade, and then, of course, Scarpa's own um, work. So, museologically, of course, it's a brilliant and constantly sort of changing way of looking at a single statue. So you have the location of it in the whole museum, the placing it at this nexus of all the histories which are then revealed, and then this fantastic connection uh, between the visitor and the statue itself. So I think that is evidence, if you need evidence, of Scarpa's extraordinary genius. And I think that picture is, says a thousand words that says that is the most extraordinary space anyone has ever created for a single work of art. Thank you very much.